Greetings, and I have a message for Jehovah's Witnesses. Absolutely everything that I teach in this video, you are going to agree with it. And you want to know why? Because it comes directly from official Watchtower publications, and including their website, jw.org. And so although you're going to agree with everything, you will never admit this to anyone for fear of being disfellowshipped. And you want to know why? Because it destroys the very foundation of the religion known as Jehovah's Witnesses. And so this is a challenge. Watch the video and then show me where and why I am wrong. And you will not be able to do so. I have shared this with Jehovah's Witnesses in the past. And you know something? It leaves them absolutely stunned. And so, in moving forward, I also have a Spanish version of this video, an hour and a half interview that I did about a year ago on YouTube. And so, I have provided a link for you in the video description beneath. All you have to do is click on that link and it'll take you right to it if you have somebody who speaks Spanish. And so, I also have this on a Word document in PDF. So, all you got to do is email me and I'll send it to you. I'll make sure that you get it, okay? And so, I outline everything that I'm going to cover in this video. And so in this video, I have two guarantees. Or actually, I have three guarantees. And I don't I seldom make guarantees, but I'm going to do it in this case. I'm going to prove, number one, that Jehovah's Witnesses have three Michaels, who are also known as Jesus Christ. Also, I'm also going to prove that Jehovah's Witnesses deny the very foundation of Christianity, and that is the resurrection. Moreover, I'm also going to prove that they deny their own foundation, their pseudo-resurrection. So, without any further delay, let's get right into this, in this video that I have prepared for you. The Three Michaels of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society It is a well-known fact that although the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses claims that everything that Jehovah's Witnesses are taught comes directly from Jehovah God, that it is actually the leaders themselves who are responsible for everything that Jehovah's Witnesses are taught. And this comes from the literature that is published annually. So in this video, absolutely everything that I tell you that they believe comes directly from official Watchtower publications. And this is important. Everything that the society teaches forms the basis of my argument that the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society has not one not two, but three Michaels in their belief system. Three Michaels who were also known as Jesus Christ. And so, all but one citation that I will be using, which I merely add for emphasis, are from the mid-1950s through the latter part of the 1990s. So although the sources that I use to show you their position on the nature of man, and which I use to prove that they have three Michaels in their belief system, may be a little old, it makes no difference at all because the society has not changed their view on this subject. In fact, the society still uses these sources on, on their website, jw.org. And I have provided you with the URLs to these in the show notes beneath the screen of this video. So we shouldn't have anyone arguing that these sources are outdated. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society's view on the nature of man. This is the doctrine that undergirds or strongly supports what I am about to share with you in the next several minutes. This doctrine is a clear denial of the very foundation of Christianity the bodily resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. As I stated in my introduction, what happens when you line up this teaching of theirs alongside another one of their major doctrines side by side, contrasting them, you end up pitting them against one another. And the Jehovah's Witness will see that one of their doctrines simply cannot stand up against the other. In other words, it is self-refuting. One of their teachings contradicts another one of their teachings. And I'm here to tell you when they see it, it leaves them visibly shaken. Again, as I stated earlier, all biblical doctrines are intricately and perfectly intertwined. In other words, they contain rich, blended connections with one another. So let me show you the two ways that you'll be able to use what I'm about to show you. The bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is the foundation of Christianity. And so the first way that you will be able to use what I show you is that you will be able to show Jehovah's Witnesses that they are denying even their own foundational belief, their so-called resurrection. What I mean by this is that anyone who is acquainted with Jehovah's Witnesses know that they deny the bodily resurrection of our Lord. 
Well, once you understand what I am going to present here, it will become ultra crystal clear to you that they deny the foundation of their own religion, their own so-called resurrection. And so the second way that you will be able to use this is in absolutely stunning fashion. There are texts that are used in an attempt to disprove the deity of Christ. I draw your attention to the right-hand side of the screen. Jehovah's Witnesses have their favorite proof texts that they use in their attempt to disprove the deity of Christ. Well, by placing the society's teaching on the nature of man alongside the text like John 8, 58 and their deceitful so-called New World Translation, you will be able to stunningly disarm them from using it. And the same is true of two of their other favorite weapons in their portable arsenal for denying the deity of Christ, Colossians 1.15 and Revelation 3.14. So let's begin our examination. My first point is that, according to the Watchtower, man is comprised of two parts, body and spirit. And we're going to review this a couple of times, a little repetitive, because I want it to stick in your mind. And so this view of theirs is what underlies much of what I will be using against them to expose their false resurrection and to disarm them from using several biblical texts, the ones I mentioned earlier. And so what I'm going to do in order for you to properly understand this and then effectively use it with Jehovah's Witnesses is I'm going to explain their view on the nature of man and so-called angels. And then I will illustrate this the way that I have in the past with Jehovah's Witnesses in person. After this, we will look to official Watchtower Bible and Tract Society literature so that you can see for yourself that the Watchtower, what they have stated on their position on the nature of man. Now, what applies here to man in Watchtower theology also applies to so-called angels, like Michael the Archangel. So let's take a close look at this, and you will clearly see that all of this is to Jehovah's Witnesses' own detriment. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society's view on the nature of man. Jehovah's Witnesses are unorthodox dichotomous. According to the Watchtower Society, man is comprised of two parts, body and spirit or life force. Spirit and life force are synonymous. According to the Watchtower Society, the spirit or life force in man is like electricity. So the spirit or life force is viewed as, views as impersonal similar to the way that they view the Holy Spirit. It is merely an energy source or power. Let me illustrate this for you the way that I have in the past with others, brothers and sisters, including Jehovah's Witnesses. Again, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society's view on the nature of man. What you see on the screen is a Bic pen. The pen represents man as a whole. And in Watchtower theology, he is two parts. Body, which the pen represents, and spirit, or life force, which the cap represents. Now, this is very important. Like I mentioned a moment ago, the spirit or life force is impersonal. According to the society, it is like electricity. And equally as important, the personality is in the body, not in the impersonal spirit or life force. According to the Watchtower Society, what I'm about to show you, this is the two-step process that Jehovah of the Watchtower used in sending his chief so-called angelic son, Michael, alias Jesus of the Watchtower, to give his life as a ransom for mankind. The pen on the screen represents the heavenly Michael. The pen to the right represents the earthly Michael, or the man, Christ Jesus of the Watchtower, once his body is united with the spirit or the life force, that is. So this is what Jehovah of the Watchtower did according to the society. Jehovah of the Watchtower transferred the impersonal life force of the heavenly Michael to the earthly fetal body of Jesus, alias Michael, the archangel in Watchtower theology. Notice how the heavenly Michael disappeared. This is because, according to the society, when Jehovah pulled the plug, as it were, and he removed Michael's spirit or life force, he ceased to exist. Annihilationism. And then the earthly Michael of the Watchtower, Jesus Christ, was born a baby. And then, this is important, the earthly Michael of the Watchtower, Jesus Christ, has never been to heaven. 
This is ultra crystal clear proof that the earthly Michael and the heavenly Michael are not the same person. There is no continuity, no uninterrupted connection between Michael number one and Michael number two. In any event, after the earthly Michael or Michael number two grew up and died on the torture stake in Watchtower theology, we are told that Jehovah repeated the very same two-step process to raise Michael as a spirit creature or a clone of Michael number one. The pen to the right signifies Michael number three, or the one who was raised a spirit, according to the society. Jehovah of the Watchtower, according to the society, transferred. Jesus' life force to Michael number three and the earthly Michael, alias Jesus Christ, ceased to exist and will never be seen or heard from ever again. And then Michael number three went to heaven, a place that he had actually never been to. And this is precisely why I have argued that Jehovah's Witnesses deny not only the bodily resurrection of Christ, but even their own so-called resurrection. Theirs is not a resurrection, but a recreation, a recreation of Michael number one. And this is the problem. There is no continuity, no uninterrupted connection between the three Michaels. The diagram on the left signifies an uninterrupted connection, a full-blown circle, whereas the diagram on the right signifies the Watchtower's teaching of the two-step process that Jehovah of the Watchtower used in sending Michael number one to ransom mankind and then bringing Michael number two into existence after Michael number one ceased to exist. Jehovah, we are told, then repeated the process by bringing Michael number three into existence after Michael number two ceased to exist when he died on the torture stake. You see, the connection between Michael number one and number two was broken when Michael number one ceased to exist. And the connection between Michael number two, the earthly Michael, and Michael number three was broken when the earthly Michael ceased to exist. You see, all of this is proof positive that Michael number three is not the same person as Michael number two. Inwardly, he is a clone. In fact, Michael number three is just like Michael number one. In fact, he is exactly like him but he is not him. So what we have here is Michael number one, who was a creation of Jehovah of the Watchtower. And both Michael number two and number three are recreations. So what all this amounts to is that there are three Michaels of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And now, the governing body speaks for itself on this subject. From the Watchtower Magazine, January 1st, 1981, Questions from Readers, page 31. The Society has written, Both humans and animals have an impersonal life force or spirit that is present in every living body cell. So first of all, according to the Society, both man and animals have an impersonal life force or spirit that is present within them. According to the Society, this is also true of so-called angels, including the Archangel Michael in Watchtower Theology, which we will see shortly. Secondly, the society makes it evident that man consists of two parts, his, his body and the impersonal life force or spirit that is present within him. So, so the society tells their readers that the spirit or life force is impersonal, yet they don't tell us here that the spirit or life force is like electricity. But they do in other places in their literature, as I will demonstrate momentarily. The society goes on to tell its readers that the Bible shows that without this vitalizing spirit, a human or an animal is dead. And what do they mean by dead? This citation is in the, in the red box is taken from the Awake magazine, July 22nd, 1979, page 27. When Jesus Christ died, he could no longer mention his heavenly father praising him. Jesus was dead. He was unconscious, out of existence. Death did not mean a transition to another life for Jesus, rather non-existent. So death, according to the society, is to be, quote unquote, out of existence. The person does not exist. This is more concretely explained 
in The Atonement Between God and Man, Volume 5 of Studies in the Scriptures, page 454, 1916. This is the only citation that I told you that, I that was not from the mid-1950s and the 1990s, which I am adding for emphasis. They still believe this today, and I have enlarged this for better visibility. Over to the right. It was necessary not only that the man Christ Jesus should die, but just as necessary that the man Christ Jesus should never live again, should remain dead, should remain our ransom price to all eternity. Look at the next one. For the man Jesus is dead, forever dead. This is vitally important because this should tell you that in Watchtower theology, the man Christ Jesus simply could not be resurrected. So let's sum this up very quickly, what we have learned thus far. Point number one is that man is comprised of two parts, body and spirit. Number two, that the spirit or life force is impersonal. The results are that without it, man ceases to exist. He is annihilated. Now, I mentioned earlier that according to the society, man and beast are not the only ones who have a spirit or life force within them but so do so-called angels as well. From the same Awake magazine this that we just read a moment ago, July 22nd, 1979, and the same page, page 7. Notice that the society states, quote, that Jehovah God, Jesus Christ, and the angels all have spirit bodies. So everything that applies to the nature of man in Watchtower theology applies equally to Jesus of the Watchtower and the other so-called angels in Watchtower theology. Jesus of the Watchtower is comprised of two parts, body and spirit, as I pointed out in the beginning. And I don't want to get into Jehovah having a body and so forth. I don't want to get sidetracked, but you can see it for yourself and you can see the ramifications. So with this, we're going to look at Step one in the heavenly process. Let's look at how all of this was carried out according to the society, beginning with step one in the heavenly process. This is taken from the Watchtower magazine, March 1st, 1960. As mankind's source of salvation, Jehovah God provided the perfect man whose life could ransom the human race by transferring the life force of his chief angelic son in the heavens to the womb of the virgin. Watchtower, page 133, March 1st, 1960. If this is the case, then according to the society's own teaching, the heavenly Michael ceased to exist. What about his personality? Awake, September 22nd, 1955, page 7. This personality is dependent upon the body and therefore it ceases to exist when the body dies. So the personality ceases to exist when the body dies. The society explains this in detail. The personality is dependent upon the body. Point number three. Is this life all there is? Page 50, 1974. The spirit does not retain the characteristics of the dead body's cells. For example, in the case of brain cells, the spirit does not retain the information stored there and continue thought processes apart from the cells. Well, since the heavenly Michael's body was dependent upon his body for his personality and ceased to exist when he died, his personality ceased to exist as well. Therefore, there is no continuity, as I mentioned earlier, no uninterrupted connection between the heavenly Michael and the earthly Michael. Let the society to continue to speak for themselves, this time explaining the two-step heavenly process from beginning to end. This personality is dependent upon the body and therefore it ceases to exist when the body dies. How is the individual, the soul, quote-unquote, with the personality, the life pattern resurrected. Notice the personality. How is it resurrected? They're going to tell you how. We might best answer that question by means of an illustration. That of a phonograph recording. There is one major problem with this. We'll see momentarily. Although you may hear a band playing its musical instruments live, including its singer, this is not the same as listening to a copy. And this is because the copy and the live performance are not 
one and the same. And the same is true of Michael number one and Michael number two and Michael number three. Although they, like the sound of a recording of a song, are exactly alike, they are not one and the same. A live performance is just that, a live performance. And a recording is a copy of a live performance. They are not one and the same. And now I must caution you, this gets a little eerie, but let's continue. The factors combining to make the life pattern are like the sounds recorded on a blank phonograph record that stands for the brain, primarily. At the same time, God is having a master disc made of the same life pattern on his marvelous memory. At death, the phonograph record is broken as it were, and what was recorded thereon would be forever lost were it not for the duplicate recording made by God. In the resurrection, God makes a blank record, a human body, and then stamps on its brain the life pattern he has recorded, just like a phonograph record. Once again, by definition, there is no continuity. They continue. Upon giving life to that body, the result is an individual that will recognize himself and be recognized by others as having previously existed. Yes, while man can kill the body, the phonograph record of our illustration, there is still the hope of a resurrection from the dead. But when God destroys both soul and body, he also wipes out the record of the life pattern from his memory. He destroys the master disc, and then there is no hope of a resurrection. A master disc. Bizarre, to say the least. Again, once again, by definition, there is no continuity. The personality is not in the life force or spirit, which is impersonal and is like electricity. Instead, the personality is dependent upon the body and stamped on the brain, not in the impersonal life force. And so according to the society, Michael number one's personality was stamped on baby Jesus's brain. And the very same process was repeated when the earthly Michael died on the torture stake in Watchtower Theology and became non-existent. Once again, there is no uninterrupted connection between the earthly Michael and the Michael that was raised the spirit in Watchtower Theology. This is what the three disconnected arrows signify, an interrupted disconnection. Before we end this session, let's look at what all of this looks like. The heavenly process according to the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Number one, Jehovah of the Watchtower removed the spirit or life force from Michael number one. Therefore, Michael number one became non-existent. Jehovah of the Watchtower then transferred Michael number one's impersonal life force to Mary's womb and then stamped a copy of Michael number one's personality on the earthly Michael's brain, which he had stored in his quote unquote marvelous memory. Again, as logic will tell you, there is no uninterrupted connection between the earthly Michael and the heavenly Michael. Inwardly, Michael number two is a clone. He has the exact personality of the heavenly Michael. So he is just like the heavenly Michael. In fact, inwardly, he is exactly like him, but he is not him. Then the earthly Michael grew up into manhood. Up at the top, the same process was repeated after Michael number two died. This same process was repeated after Michael number two died on the torture stake in Watchtower Theology. Jehovah of the Watchtower transferred Michael number two's impersonal life force to Michael number three's new heavenly body. And the earthly Michael ceased to exist. And Jehovah of the Watchtower stamped a copy of Michael number two's personality on Michael number three's brain, which he had stored in his quote unquote marvelous memory. Once again, 
As logic tells you, there is no continuity between the two Michaels, no uninterrupted connection between the heavenly Michael and the earthly Michael. Just like I noted earlier, Michael number three is just like the earthly Michael inwardly. Because inwardly he has a copy of the earthly Michael's personality, but he is not him. Moreover, Michael number three is a clone of Michael number one. They are both spirit creatures, whereas the earthly Michael has their personality, though he is a mere human. So what all this amounts to is a recreation. The heavenly Michael, Michael number one, is a creation, whereas the earthly Michael, Michael number two, and Michael number three are recreations. Michael number three is a clone of Michael number one. So what all of this evokes is the thought that all of this was done in Jehovah of the Watchtower's heavenly laboratory. This is the science fiction type of theology that one can only get from a cult and make one's hair stand up. He created Michael the Archangel, the firstborn of all creation. In fact, there is no limit to the number of Michaels that he could have created. I would be remiss if I failed to point out the society uses the term resurrection in the Awake magazine September 22nd there on the screen. However, that theirs is not a resurrection is ultra crystal clear from their own doctrine, namely by the disconnection between Michael number two and Michael number three. You see, Michael number two ceased to exist. And then Jehovah of the Watchtower produced another version of Michael number two, who is not one and the same person as Michael number two, thereby denying the foundation of Christianity, the resurrection, and their own foundation, a pseudo-resurrection. Resurrection defined, a raising or standing up of that which died. Indeed, our Lord has risen from the dead, not as the earthly Michael, Michael number three of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, who was recreated and then deceived many by materializing a body that looked like the one that belonged to the earthly Michael, Michael number two, leading people to believe that he had risen from the dead. And now to show you how to use the society's own teaching on the nature of man as so-called angels to disarm Jehovah's Witnesses from using some of their favorite proof texts in their attempt to support their claim that Jesus is a created being. Disarming Jehovah's Witnesses of certain texts commonly cited in their attempt to support their claim that Christ is a created being. Let's say that a Jehovah's Witness calmly and confidently opens up his New World Translation and then reads the words of Christ in John 8, 58, thinking that he is about to successfully defuse your attempt to prove that Christ is the great I Am of Exodus 3, 14. So in the so-called New World Translation, the Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and you have seen Abraham? Michael number 2 responds, most truly, I say to you, before Abraham came into existence, I have been. He can't say this. He came into existence in Mary's womb long after Abraham was born. But this distorted wording makes Michael number two claim that he has been in existence before Abraham was born. You know what I say to Jehovah's Witnesses when they read this? You don't believe that. And then I explain their own teaching to them on the nature of man and so-called angels. I'm telling you. This is worth its weight in eternal gold. Believe me, if they're really listening to you and following you on this, they will be left visibly shaken. They will be unable to hide it. In any event, Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe this. And guess what? Neither did the Jews. Jehovah's Witnesses like to cite Colossians 1.15 to prove that Jesus is a created being, citing the term firstborn, thinking that it means first created. Well, just like I've told other witnesses who have cited this text in their attempt to prove their position, you don't believe that? And then I explain the society's teaching to them on the nature of man and so-called angels. You see, they do not believe that the Michael who was in heaven when Paul wrote these words... Michael number three was the first to be created, nor that the earthly Michael, Michael number two, was the first to be created. No, this honor can only go 
to Michael number one, who was the first thing that Jehovah of the Watchtower ever created. You see, by placing the society's teaching on the nature of man alongside their teaching on the nature of Christ, side by side, you end up pitting them against one another. And the Jehovah's Witness will see that their objection to the eternal deity of Christ simply cannot stand up against the other doctrine. It is self-refuting. In other words, one of their teachings contradicts another one of their teachings, and it usually leaves them stunned. Let's look at one last example where we can do the same to disarm Jehovah's Witnesses. Revelation 3.14 is another one of Jehovah's Witnesses' favorite proof texts that they use in their attempt to prove that Christ is a created being. It reads, To the angel of the congregation in Laodicea write, These are the things that the Amen says, faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation by God, the so-called New World Translation. Well, think about it. Just like Colossians 1.15, the Michael who was in heaven when John wrote these words was Michael number 3. That's why I tell witnesses who cite this text, you don't believe that. Then I explain the society's teaching to them on the nature of man and so-called angels. You see, Michael number 1 was the first creature that Jehovah of the Watchtower ever created, not Michael number 3. Michael number three was a clone, a recreation, certainly not the beginning of God's creation, according to the society's own teaching. You see, I shared this with the most brilliant Jehovah's Witness that I ever engaged with in a debate on the eternal deity of Christ. And I'm going to call him Tom for the sake of this example. He was employed by NASA. So he was a real brainiac. Well, he just finished reading Revelation 3.14 to me, as many Jehovah's Witnesses had in the past, and I said to him, there is nothing in the context that supports that interpretation. But you don't believe that anyway. And he looked at me, puzzled, and he asked, what do you mean? Well, as I delineated the society's view on the nature of man, his partner who was sitting next to him kept nodding approvingly, saying, yep, that's what we believe. Yep, that's what we believe. Yep, that's what we believe. The entire time, though Tom kept glancing at his friend, giving him a troubled look, like, would you please shut up? Because he saw the point that I was making. And after I had finished, Tom looked like he had just seen a ghost. And now to summarize what we have learned in this video, we have seen that Jehovah's Witnesses deny the foundation of Christianity. It is not enough to say that Christ was resurrected. By definition, theirs is a recreation. Michael number three never came back from the dead. He was just like the Michael who died, but he was not the one that died. So we have seen from the society's own literature that they not only deny the foundation on which Christianity is squarely based, but I have also proven that they even deny their own foundational belief, their pseudo-resurrection. And so this brings me to my guarantees. I have come through on my guarantees and I have proven from the society's own literature that they have three Michaels, who are also known as Jesus Christ. These three Michaels are separate and distinct persons. The copy of the personality in the phonograph illustration really drives this point home. And the disconnection between the three Michaels is ultra crystal clear. And I have shown that by contrasting their view on the nature of man and so-called angels with their view on the nature of Christ and their favorite proof text denying the eternal deity of Christ, that this contradicts their view on Christ, thereby disarming them from trying to use biblical texts such as John 8.58. Colossians 1.15 and Revelation 3.14 in their attempt to prove that Christ is a created being. Well, if you'll notice, I left a gap right under number two. This is because you can add other statements concerning Christ and his pre-existence to this list, like John 17.5, where he said, Father, glorify me with the glory that I had before you before the world was. You see, once again, Jehovah's Witnesses do not believe this. And you can also add Proverbs 8.22-31 through 31 and Micah 5.2 to this list. The Proverbs text is taken by Jehovah's Witnesses as referring to the heavenly Michael. So they cannot apply this to the earthly Michael. And conversely, the Micah text is referring to the earthly Michael. So Micah could not be saying that the earthly Michael's origin was sometime in eternity past. And this is because they are not the same person. And this is because, as I have labored to make evident, the earthly Michael had his brain stamped 
with a copy of the Heavenly Michael's personality. Not that the Heavenly Michael continued to exist as a person. And so in bringing this video to its conclusion, I want to raise the following question to Jehovah's Witnesses. How can you say that the child that you see in the afterlife is the same person that you raised in this life and not merely that he is exactly like him? In other words, he is a clone of your loved one. And you can raise this question to any other members of your family, like your husband, your wife, your siblings, your relatives. Well, if you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses and you have come to the conclusion that you have been had, misled by the Watchtower Society, and you have come to the conclusion that they are not God's organization as they claim, all you have to do is cry out to Him. He is not far from each one of us, as Paul wrote in Acts 17, 27 and 28, for in Him we live and move and exist. And so I'll point you in the direction where you can find real peace and eternal serenity, the real gospel, what the Bible teaches, rather than the Marvel comic type of theology taught by the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. Romans 1.16 reads, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Romans 1.16 And so I hope that you, my brothers and sisters, have found this tutorial to be of great assistance, and that you will use what you have learned here to reach Jehovah's Witnesses who have lost their way. And so until next time, this is Angel Oriano Jr. reminding you to always remember to do all things according to the Scriptures.